morning and welcome to the Congregational Church on Mercer Island on this beautiful Orthodox Easter Sunday. Please stand if you are able to join in the call to worship. Come, let us worship the God who loved us before we were yet born. Let us worship God who knows us better than we know ourselves. This is the God whose presence never leaves us. This is the God whose love for us never wavers. This is the God who welcomes us here. We worship with joy. Let us worship with our opening hymn, which is hymn number 90, Come Christians Join to Sing.
one more, um, in addition to obviously your exam, we've got tickets and we certainly love an overflowing house is always great. So please do think about who else you haven't invited or talked to yet and, and go ahead and make those plans. But I am also um, working still on the baskets. We're going to have baskets to be wrapped or to be drawn for at the evening. And it's really fun for people to be able to browse those and look at things that they might win. I would love to still get a few more baskets. I know people have done them in the past, and so I'm asking you to dig deep and think about whether you could still maybe put a basket together for us. And if so, if you could let me know after church today, that would be fabulous. Oh, and Cheryl's letting me know that we also still, of course, are happy in, in terms of having some experiences that we will be having uh, under silent auction for the evening. These are things like perhaps you have season tickets to the theater or to a baseball or soccer, those kinds of things, and you maybe want to put together an evening where somebody could use those and have an event themselves. Um, perhaps you have a boat. You could take someone out for a private sale. Perhaps, um, I'm not thinking about this off the top of my head very well. So anyway, if you have anything along those lines, again, talk with myself or you can talk with Cheryl. <laughs> dinners, if you'd like to put on a special kind of dinner and, in, you know, have that to be raffled off, that would be super, too, but Carol's ideas were really good. Um, I will be selling tickets for a short time after service today. Last Next Sunday is the last time to buy tickets. We will not be selling tickets at the door because Eric and Jenny really do need to have a good, solid head count. So um, please see me today and immediately after the service or next Sunday, especially if you've like told me, hey, save me some seats, I really need to collect the money for those tickets and really get you on the diagram, the floor diagram. So see me today, please. So Cheryl, I'm gonna say that if, if all of a sudden you need to bring someone to the dinner, we won't collect your money, but you need to donate much more during the donation parts. <laughs> um, any other announcements? people have. We have right here. Right here. So, I only stand up and talk. Yes, I can talk. <laughs> I only stand up and talk when I want to invite you to something, and this is the second annual concert for Puerto Rico. We did one of these last year, and some of you came, and it was a wonderful evening. Good food, lots of music, lots of great singing. It was such a popular event with the Puerto Rican community here in this area that they said, please, please, please do it again next year. So here we are doing it again, and this year it benefits a fisherman's organization on Puerto Rico. They lost a lot of their boats and equipment in the hurricane, and there has been very little assistance to get their equipment restored and their boats fixed. So even though it's been over, well over a year since the hurricane, they're pretty much where they were when it happened. So hopefully we can do as well for this organization as we did for the clinic last year. They raised over $3,000, which might not sound like that much, but every little bit helps and it actually helped the clinic immensely. So it is Friday night here at the church. The church is one of the sponsors. Thank you, Roberta, for making that happen again at 7.30 and um, tickets at the door. And I hope you can come. It'll be mostly me accompanying and some 20-year-old wonderkind pianist, but mostly me. And I will actually be playing by myself. So I was practicing during the prelude. I will be playing that piece and a couple others at the concert. So if you want to hear me actually play piano recital, you gotta come. So thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, so um, Kristen and Blake in the choir and Pete and I all sing with the Somerset Chorale, which is a community chorus that rehearses up at Forest Ridge. It's directed by Allison Seaton, who has used to be a part of this church and has come back to see us several times. So our concert is today at four, it's free, it's not going to be terribly long, I would not be over an hour, I know, and it's fun music, so I was hoping maybe some of you can come. Four o'clock, Forest Ridge, thank you. 
sorry to grab this. I just want to put in a quick plug for guess who's coming to dinner. Uh, we, made, we decided a, a good day to have it would be June 1st, and I decided I'd start publicizing it after Easter, and lo and behold, here we are. For those of you who've never done it, it's a, uh, a kind of a surprise social event. You can sign up either to host an event in your home, in which case you supply beverages and you wait for the food to arrive, or you can be a guest where you get assigned a main dish, dessert, or, or salad, and you are given an address to go to. Um, in, in theory, it's all a mystery who you're going to be spending the evening with, except that they're wonderful people from this church, and it's an opportunity to get to know folks that possibly you haven't had a chance to talk with before. Sign up sheet, the reason I'm saying it now, sign up sheets have been put up this week, and that's what that's all about. If you have any questions, uh, you know, you can ask me, and we will, we will let you know uh, by like the week beforehand. So Memorial Day is kind of the, the cutoff date for signing up. Thank you. This will never end. <laughs> uh, I have a card that is for Lori Gelzer, whose husband Joe died about two weeks ago. And, uh, and so if you would please sign it. And if you remember, she was this, is this lovely woman that we all care about. And she was so kind to us. Um, mailing us letters, and uh, taking photographs for the church. So, the, the, please sign. I have to go to the front because I have a show and tell. Um, Friday night at the Pacific Northwest Conference of the United Church of Christ, our conference, uh, had the, the um, first ever, uh, I can't think of a name, revival. revival. See, this is not a UCC thing, <laughs> but now it is. And it was very wonderful. And um, on Saturday, we had our conference annual meeting, which is one of the most exciting things that ever happens in the, well, it's fascinating. <laughs> it is fascinating. And it was actually a very good meeting. And this church won two awards. Um, and I have them here. <laughs> They're both financially oriented. They were, um, they were given by two men from the uh, uh, God, stewardship. My brain is not connected to my mouth today. The stewardship committee, which Roberta serves on, so she couldn't receive the awards, so I did. Um, one of them was for being a five for five congregation of the United Church of Christ. There's probably nobody here who knows what that means. But what that means is that we actually participate in all of the special collections that the UCC does during the year. Our church's wider mission, basic support, that's our church's wider mission is what makes it possible for us to have a conference and a, a national uh, organization. Neighbors in Need, One Great Hour of Sharing, the Christmas Fund, and Strength of the Church, special offerings. And, and you know, not all churches participate in all of these. Not all churches participate in very many of them, and we did. So we were one of them, and we received this certificate for it. Now, the other one was one of the most fun times of the, of the conference annual meeting. They gave out very special awards, and these are for churches who did something special in the way of one great hour of sharing. And they divided the churches into uh, congregational size groups. And for our size, we won the golden, we have a debate about what this is. I think it's a measuring cup. Some people <laughs> think it's a scoop. I'm not really sure whether either of those is particularly appropriate, but we gave the most for our size of congregation. And everyone applauded that, and we're very proud, and I'm gonna give these to Gail. And next week I hope to have that. <laughs> I hope to have about three minutes to talk about what the content of the meeting was because it was spectacular. Thank <laughs> you.
think Eric's going to be talking about what's happening next um, in terms of worship in the church. Um, but we're starting a new book group. Um, people to read this book, which is called Climate Church, Climate World. In the weekly email, I've been sending out notices that it's on sale just from, until the end of the month. Uh, and several of you have bought copies uh, for that discount price. I bought three more, three extra copies, just in case. So these are yours for $17. And after today, really, after Tuesday, they will go up to 25 So if you'd like a copy, uh, $17. And the book group will start next Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. Also a chance uh, Thursday evenings at 6, if you'd rather come in the evening. And I have a real quick announcement. You might remember um, a while back, Michael came to the church and he led us in emergency pre uh, preparation and stuff. Um, Bob, is it not working? The mic? Okay, right. Um, and he led us in emergency preparation stuff. Uh, Michael's going to be here next Sunday after church just to give us a refresher course on the AED that's on the wall by the front door in case somebody collapses like myself today and you need to plug me in. Michael's going to remind us next week how to do that. So if a few of you could stay afterwards, it won't take long. Uh, it would be great just to have that refresher course. So thanks. I'm going to take one more minute just to talk about what's going to happen in the next six weeks, starting next well, Sunday. Bob? I want to remind the Buildings and Grounds Committee that the, up there, we've got to get uh, <laughs> something on here to stop the sun. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? We have to discuss it. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's why they call this a congregational church. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, starting next week, we are going to have a season of invitation. Um, it will be a six-week series. It will be part of what Roberta speaks about each Sunday, um, which will be a, a, a chance for you to invite people to come to this church, whether it can be one week, two weeks, hopefully all six weeks for this series. Um, I was reminded this morning very strongly about how this works. I got a call at 9 o'clock this morning from my sister, new member of this church, saying, I've invited another person to church, can we take them? And I said, you bet. So, um, Bonnie Chin is in the back with Nancy. <laughs> Nancy, although Nancy's been here like two months and she's already invited two new people to church. <laughs> and I started thinking as I was driving to pick them up, I started thinking about why don't we, why, why don't we do what Nancy does? Nancy's excited about this church. She goes, and talking all the way here, you're going to love this, what Roberta says, and today, hopefully they all the same. But, <laughs> <laughs> but with what Roberta says, the people that you're going to meet, and she describes in detail how great this church is. And she's just, you know, really outgoing about that. And I thought, why are we, you know, if we went to a new restaurant, we would be telling everybody, oh, the food was great, and this, and the service, and you know. But when it comes to church, we don't tend to want to do that. Well, I'm going to challenge all of you today to, if you can't speak that way about our church, you need to talk to each other about that, and you need to talk to Roberta about that. So we start to get a dialogue going of, how do we talk about this church? You know, how do we make it? Like, we not only are going to this restaurant, we own this restaurant, and we cook, and we serve, and we do everything, so we should take ownership in that great experience that we have each week. Um, that's my challenge for you today. We'll start the challenge next week with Robert in charge of it, too. So, um, anyway, uh, Take a moment, say hi to Bunny Chin in the back and each other and wish each other the peace of Christ. Yes, Roberta? The postcard is to give to somebody. Everybody has a postcard in their bullet. Okay. This is You've got the notice. <laughs> peace of Christ, go on.
the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I do not call you as servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. <clears throat> I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. It's kind of, it must be different. Dale's about to preach with Roberta on Busman's holiday in the back. You came just to listen to him, didn't you? I know. Anyway, but I'm excited to hear what the purpose, the power, and the paradox of ministry truly is. Dale Roman. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The house Roberta and I live in has two upstairs front bedrooms. And it's a small bedroom, so I claim one of those bedrooms as my study. And because it's a bedroom, it's made from bedroom, it has a closet. And I use that closet to put all kinds of things that I cannot yet get rid of, but I do not want to see every day. I even put a couple bookshelves in there, and I put books in it. So in this closet, you'll find books, you'll find CDs, you'll find DVDs, you'll find all kinds of things. About three weeks ago, I was in my study, about two o'clock in the morning, and I got up and I slid the closet door open to get something, and I looked and I saw a black box. When I was ordained, they're not leaving, they're getting out of the sun. <laughs> when I was ordained, my parents gave me a really nice version of the Jerusalem Bible, and it came in a black box. Well, I took the book out, of course, put it on the shelf, and I suspected that Bible sitting in the earth upstairs. But I kept the black box. But here's the thing. I was ordained in 1980, and it's 2019 now, and I still have the black box. The black box has gone from California to Northwest England, to Northeast England, down to London, and now back to Renton. The black box is a mess. I've had to put tape around it to hold it together. I was standing there looking at the black box at 2 o'clock in the morning, completely forgetting why I opened the door in the first place, and I said to myself, what in heaven's name could be in this black box? So I took the box, and I sat down at my desk, and I opened it up, and lo and behold, there was a big rubber band in there. I don't, I don't know why there's a rubber band in the black box. There was money, there was cash from countries that I visited through the years. But more intriguing, there were three cassette tapes in there. And one of them said, and it wasn't in my handwriting, but somebody had written on the cassette tape, Dale, Gurnville, 1986, The Purpose, Paradox, and Power of Ministry. Now, Gurnville's a town north of San Francisco, and I was an interim minister in this, in this church for about a year. This cassette is obviously a sermon I had said, or given, but I had no memory of it at all. And so I got up, and I found a cassette player, and I put on my things, and I started listening to it. And i got to tell you, it wasn't a terrible sermon, <laughs> but it wasn't that good either. And so relax, I am not going to play it for you. <laughs> <laughs> but what didn't treat me was the purpose, the paradox, and the power of ministry. And that I do want to share but we have to start real quick and deal with the word ministry. And many of you have heard this, I'm sure, so I'm going to do it very quickly. We don't have all the time in the world. When Roberta and Peggy and Dale, who's not here today, and myself were ordained, we were not ordained into the priesthood. 
we were ordained into being a part of the laity, which means being a part of you, being a part of the people. Laity just means the people or the work of the people. And we were not separate. We are not separate from that. The word ministry is very simply a word that means to serve. And by the very fact that you're sitting here today means that you're serving here in this community in some way. Now, when I was a minister, I also served. It was just that I served differently. But my faith, my calling, was no different qualitatively than yours. I can see many of you nodding your head, recognizing there's nothing special about me. <laughs> We're all in this together. So when I use the word ministry, what I'm talking about is what you and I do. Right? Simple? So we can move on? Yes. It's about how we serve. So when I say the purpose of ministry, what I'm talking about is what we do, our purpose. Now, the purpose of ministry is very simple. It is simply to love one another. That does not come as a surprise to you. It is to love one another. Now, I'm not saying that the other things we do are not important. We fight for justice. We care for each other. But the heart of why we're here is because we love one another. Stan does not go and serve breakfast to homeless people on Sunday morning because he hates people. <laughs> Peggy does not spend a lot of time working for the conference because she thinks people are silly. Though some of them she meets are silly. We're here because we love one another now, or we should. Many of you have heard about the word love in Christian tradition, biblical tradition. There's several kinds of this love. We've got fancy Greek names for them. There's love of family, in the family, and some people have extended that family word to me in community. There's love between friends. There's love between lovers. There's self-love, and I mean a healthy, good self-love. And of course, there's agape. That's the one we talk about mostly, that agape love, which is sometimes very hard to, to, to define. But it's that love that people describe as selflessness, sometimes they describe it as charity, universal, that love that is more closely defined, connected to, linked to divinity, the divine, that love that God has for us and we have for God and each other. If you go home and Google agape, you'll see a whole lot of us trying to describe it. But there is one word that I'm going to use today, which is a very dull word, a very not religious word. And so for agape, I want to use the word well-being. Simple as that. You know well-being. It means happiness, health, prosperity. It means contentment, satisfaction with life. It means positive emotions, not negative. It means not anxiety. It means seeking peacefulness. It means seeking togetherness, well-being in life. What I like about the word is it reminds me that when we're talking about this stuff, the wholeness of the human being is vitally important. So if you are sleeping in a cardboard box, hungry and scared that you might be attacked during the night, it's hard for you to talk about agape. It's hard for you to be deeply spiritual if that's your situation. When I was working in international relations in London, our department hired a taxi, an airport taxi company, because we were going to and from the, taxi, the airport all the time. And those people came to me to pick me up at the house, and they were driving a company car, but sometimes they carry their own car. And one early evening, when I was getting ready to go to India, knock on the door, guy said, I'm a taxi driver, I'm a bit early, I'm the Jaguar across the street. So I got my bag, and I got into the Jaguar, and it would have to be one of these taxi drivers that really liked Paul. All I had to do was sit back in the Jaguar and listen. He told me how he was a good Christian. There's no reason to doubt that. 
He told me about his church. He told me that he'd retired, but he was driving this taxi because he liked meeting people and talking to them. He told me about his London house, which was apparently a lot nicer than our London house. He loved his London house, and he really liked his house on the coast. And then he said to me this, and I quote, he said, I'm going to tell you something, and I tell, her, tell everybody this. As long as you have faith, you don't need anything else. And sitting there, feeling the softness of the leather in the Jaguar, I said, yeah, right. 17 hours later, I was in one of those motorized, what do you call them? Rickshaws. On a narrow, chaotic, Mumbai street with a little boy running next to me, holding an infant, begging for money. And I said to myself, if you have faith, you don't need anything else. Now, don't get me wrong. He was a nice guy. And I liked the Jaguar. And if just one of my books would go viral, I would love to buy a house in Maui <laughs> and escape Seattle winters. I would. But what gets to me is the oftentimes blindness of self-piety. If you seek desire and work for well-being of people, It'd be useful to know if their hearts are shattered. It'd be useful to know if they are so anxious because they can't pay their bills that they can't sleep. It'd be useful to know if they're just plain hungry. If I were a good Christian, or Jew, or Muslim, or Sikh, or Buddhist, or Sufi, or human, I would desire to seek and work for the well-being of everybody everywhere, but I'm not, and I don't. I should, but I don't. But I am saved in the sense of this, that I belong to this community. And this community demands of me that I desire to seek and work for your well-being and the well-being of people outside our community. That's why I'm here. I mean, admittedly, I'm married to the minister, so I kind of have to be here. <laughs> but I'm here to love one another. And if I don't, sort of makes a mockery of that reading. So the purpose of ministry is to be a community of well-being. And if you're worried about or thinking about what kind of relationships we have in that, you go back to the reading where Jesus says, I am no longer your teacher, and some translation would say, I'm no longer your master. You are no longer my students or my servants. We are now friends. This is a community of ministry, which is a community of friendship, which is a community of well-being. It's as simple as that. The paradox, the paradox, of ministry is that if you succeed at the purpose, you will be broken. There is no way of escaping that. The only way of escaping that is to not love, to not desire seeking work for the well-being of others and yourself. You will be broken. You know that. You've experienced that. But I want to make a point, too, and that is that this brokenness is not unnatural, is not a surprise, is not a pathology. It is life. I mentioned Germany north of San Francisco, where I was serving for a year. The ministry was only going to last about a year, so I wasn't going to move from Oakland up to Guernville. And so I needed a place to stay, and somebody in the church 
offered me her home. I think, this was 1986, I think I had a, a separate entrance, but we, I never used it. Her name was Verge, and I guess her name was Virginia, I never asked, everybody called her Verge. Verge and I spent through that year many nights sitting in her living room late at night drinking whiskey. What I learned when I first went to stay with her was about three or four weeks before she opened her door to me, her husband had died. Which is a tragedy. Which is brokenness. But I also learned that she had cared for him for years. She was his primary caregiver. And so what she was experiencing late at night with me, with whiskey, was the brokenness, the tragedy, the death of her husband whom she loved. At the same time, a sense, a feeling of liberation, because she was free, immediately felt by the feeling of guilt. And so there she was. Death, liberation, guilt, brokenness. That was 1986. Many of you know that I had a website. And people would, it was for writers, and they would send writing to me. And it always started with an email. I had to explain how it was working. And some of those people I kept up an email relationship with. And one woman by the name of Chris, who lives in Stockholm, we've been emailing now for about a year and a half. And a few months ago, maybe five months ago, I got an email from her. And she said to me, three weeks before I wrote this email, my sister's young son died in an accident. She said, but, but the other thing is this, is that, is that the woman I love, I haven't told her yet, but the woman, I'm, the woman I'm in love with just told me she's engaged to a guy. And, and she said in the email, she said, you know, I, I feel like my heart's cold, it's turning to stone. You know that, it's a cliche, but, but it's a feeling you have. And she wasn't saying that she wants it to turn to stone, she's saying it is as an act of self-preservation, protection. And see, the other thing that I'm actually very frightened about, that I'm really worried about, is that when I do get through to the other side, her language, when I get through to the other side, I'm going to find that life is actually gray. So if you succeed at the purpose, you will experience some brokenness. And now for the heart. The power of the mystery. This is the hard part. If you get through to the other side, then what's waiting for you is joy. And I say it's the hard part because it's oftentimes easier to talk about pain and sorrow and suffering. You can find the words to talk about that, but it's sometimes it's very difficult to talk about joy. And sometimes it sounds sentimental. It sounds shallow. And I struggle to find the words to talk to you about this. Right now, here I am, this morning, doing this. And so I want to start by telling you what it's not, okay? Your joy will be complete, but this is what it's not. I don't do well when people tell me that happiness is a choice. I don't like that. I get it. It is sometimes a choice. I get that. Oftentimes, I'm in the afternoon at home reading. I'm, 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 it's great. I'm home reading. It's peaceful. And then I hear the garage door. So I know Roberta's coming home. And, and shortly, the garage door is going to close. And then, and then the kitchen door is going to open. And she's going to walk in. I've been reading, sitting there peacefully. And she starts saying, how are you doing? How's your day? And how are you doing? What are you reading? I'm home. And I'm sitting there going, God, is this annoying? <laughs> She is so annoying there. I said, I said, you know, I just said we're reading and she's so annoying. You're laughing, but come on, you must have read it. Eric, isn't Michael annoying sometimes? Yes. Come on, let's go. Nine times out of ten, though, 
I say to myself, I'm sitting there, I said, Dale, why are you feeling annoyed? What, what's going on? Where is the source of the annoyment? And when I ask that question over and over again, there is no source of the annoyment. And so what I start doing is I make the choice. I start saying nice things to her, like, oh, that sounds nice. Like, oh, that's lovely. That's great. And I make sure that my tone of voice is also, also loving. So it's not just the words. I'm pretending. I'm acting to make this real. And then just to cap it all off, I say to her, I love you. And I'm not annoying anymore. I get it. Sometimes happiness is a choice. We could just pause for one moment, everybody. Just one moment. Roberta, mm -hmm. you do realize when I say I love you, it's not always going to annoy you, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dinner's going to be all right. Right? <laughs> I do get it sometimes as a choice. <clears throat> but it isn't for me. For me, happiness is fragile. It's momentary. I suspect there's not a day in my life when I wish that I could be overwhelmed with happiness. That I could hang on to it. And if I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling happy, I know that, that may not last. Matter of fact, I know it won't. And so when people say to me, happiness is a choice, I say that's a bunch of nonsense. It is not. It is not. Henry Nallen wrote a book called Life Signs. And he talked about the passages that Eric uh, read for us. And he said, a better translation for the word joy is ecstasy. Ecstasy. You get that? Ecstasy. And he turned to the Greek word, which I now forgot how to pronounce. Ecstasy. <laughs> And he said, the literal meaning of the word ecstasy is, the first, the ek, the ek, in the Greek, is out. And the second part of the word is stasis. And what the word means is to move out of a static place, to move out of being frozen, to move out. And so if you go back to Verge, or a lovely Verge, what she was, and use whatever imagery you want to use, she was stuck. She was in prison. She was in a tomb. And what she had to do was to move out of that. And that would be joyous. And Chris from Stockholm, now, I, I, I said to her, what you would have said to her? I said, yeah. yeah. Your heart can stay cold and, and stone, and it won't be fragile anymore. You will be protected, but of course the obvious is that you won't love. You can't have both. But something else. Henry Nowen also said that because ecstasy, complete joy, is moving out of what he said is the old place, the old pain, the old sorrow, whatever it might be, you are, by definition, moving into a new place. And so what I said to Chris was, I don't know you that well, but I know you a little bit. We've been talking to each other for about a year. I doubt very much that when you get to the other side, you're going to find greatness. You're going to find greatness. I just don't think that's in your future. But you will not find what you were. You will have moved into a new place. And so I'm not saying the colors aren't going to be as bright, but the colors may be a bit different. I'm not going to say the sounds are not as glorious, but the sounds may be a bit different. You will be in a new place. Still with me? I've just about reached the end of what I'm prepared to say to you. But as I've been saying this, I've been recalling a conversation that Eric and I had on Thursday afternoon. We got together to talk about who's going to do what this morning. 
And Eric, I'm not going to represent this well, so forgive me. But Eric was talking about when he was uh, singing professionally and performing, about how you had to believe in the performance. You had to believe in what was being said or sung. You had to believe in the character. And I said, well, preaching, and I never apologize about this, preaching is a form of performance. And yes, you have to believe in what you're saying. Or you have to be a really good performer. <laughs> and Eric said, no, I don't think. I don't, I don't think you can be that good a performer. And so, standing here right now, thinking about that conversation, it dawns on me that you have a right to ask me some questions. You won't. Because I'm not going to let you. <laughs> but this is what I imagine you could ask. Dale, do you think that the movement from brokenness to ecstasy is a flash, is a dream, is a magical moment? No, I don't. I don't believe in magic. I really do not believe in magic. Do you believe in the integrity of the concept, of the idea of moving from brokenness to complete joy? Do you believe in that possibility? Yes. I do. Can you believe in something that you find difficult? Something that you can't find the words for? You can't find the words to tell these good people? Can you still believe in it? <sighs> yes, I can. Well, it's not good news for a preacher. Okay. Dale, have you experienced complete joy in your life? No, I have not. Well, that's great, Dale. Will you? Will you sometime in your life? I don't know. But I have to believe it's possible. Great. So what do you finally want to say to us so we can go home and get out of here? First of all, I don't think the movement from brokenness to joy is a one-time thing. About a month ago, I got a message from a friend in Guerneville telling me that Burge had died. She was 93 years old, which meant that when we were sitting in her living room drinking whiskey, she was around 60 years old. I heard that her life was a good life and a fruitful life after her husband died. But I'm willing to bet to you, I'm willing to bet that the movement from brokenness to joy happened almost every day of her life. That it was a continual process. Like, nobody should go through that movement alone. And I, I even wonder, and you might be able to help me with so I even wonder if most of us are capable of making that movement alone. Virgil had family and friends, but she also had her community of ministry, her community of well-being, her community of friendship, her church, and that helped her tremendously. Chris, I don't know. I don't know if she has a community, but I certainly hope she does, because I don't like the idea of her getting stuck in cold grayness. Which leads me to the last point. Leads me to the last point. You should listen to Roberta and Dell and Eric when they tell you that it's important that this community of well-being exists 50 years from now. 
because somebody's well-being may depend upon its existence. And so when they say to you, invite somebody to church, wow, oh, that's really scary. <laughs> I've been racking my brain, who am I going to invite? And if it just sounds too churchy, then don't invite them to church. Invite them to a community of well-being. Invite them to a community of friendship and say to them, you are all welcome. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, you are welcome. Eric, what happens next? <laughs> well, even a community of well-being needs money to pay the bills. <laughs> so, if, if you would, we would, I haven't done this in so long. It's time for the offering. Sarah, I'd like to read something for you. It's a book that Roberta and I have used quite some time, it's called Gorillas of Grace by uh, Ted Loder, and um, you look at it afterwards, the pages are falling out, and just thinking about my past ministries and so on, I pulled out this book, and I'd like to read this prayer for you. So let us be encouraged to enter. Oh God of timelessness and time, we thank you for our time and for those things that are yet possible and precious in it. Daybreak and beginning again, midnight and the touch of angels, the taming of demons and the dance of dreams. The word of forgiveness, and sometimes a song for our grieving, for our life. Thank you for the honesty which marks friends and makes laughter, for the fierce gentleness which dares to speak truth and love and tugs us to join the long march towards peace. For the sudden gust of grace which raises unexpectedly in our wending from dawn to dawn. For children unabashed, wind rippling over a rain puddle, a mockingbird in the darkness, a colleague in a cup of coffee. For all the mysteries of loving, of our bodies next to another body, for music and silence, for wrens and oran, for everything that moves us to tears, to touching, to dreams, to prayers, for our longing, our life. Thank you for work which engages us in an, in an, in an internal debate between right and reward and stretches us towards responsibility to those who pay for our work to those who cannot pay because they do not have work, for justice which repairs the devastation of poverty, for liberty which extends to the captives of violence, for healing which binds up the broken body, the broken heart, for bread broken for all the hungry of the earth, for good news of love which is stronger than death, and for peace, for all to sit under a fig tree and not be afraid, for our calling our life. Thank you for the sharp senses of the timeless stirring in our time and your praise in our heart. For the undeniable awareness, quick as now, that the need of you is the truth of us and your presence with us is the truth of you, which sets us free for others, for joy and for you for our grace, our life, and forever. And let us now say together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And let us stay at our day of death, and let us not sin, as we pray to those who sin against us. stand as you're able for our closing hymn, which is number 230, Now the Green Blade Rises.
Oh, oh, oh.